Welcome to AXA Coral Live. We're broadcasting from the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean. I'm delighted to have with me this morning Dr. Mark Vermeer, Director of Science at Kamabi. Thank yes. you. <laughs> many, many hats that you, you wear, probably. A little bit. <laughs> um, but we're here in the wet lab um, of the research station. And today we're really talking about the coral ecosystem. So this morning we had a live investigation looking at the food chains and food webs on the reef and some of those animals and other plants that you might find out here in the waters of Curaçao. But we're here today to have a look around the wet lab to see how all this fits together and to find out a bit more about what it takes to be running an amazing research station like this one. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you as well. Um, before we start, it's amazing. We've got schools from Nigeria, the UK, Bermuda, um, USA, Greece, Scotland apparently is a separate country um, this morning, um, uh, India, uh, Thailand and Egypt joining us. So welcome um, one and all. So, that, that. so very briefly, we're, we're, we're here at Kamabi. What, what is what is Kamabi? Um, <coughs> Kamabi is actually a little bit of uh, everything. It's one of the older, uh, it's the second oldest uh, research station in the Caribbean. And that is uh, something that grew 60 years ago. And uh, with the purpose of sort of finding out what was happening out uh, in the ocean. And the reason why that is, because most people might know, uh, it's actually not that long that we can actually scuba dive. Uh, that's only possible for 60 years. And because of that, um, we basically knew nothing about what's, what was happening in the ocean. So only when scuba diving became a thing six years ago, we could jump in the ocean and go look at what was happening there. And it was around that time that some people on Curacao thought that was very, very interesting and decided to build Kamabi. And then over time, Kamabi grew, 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 grew a little bit more. And now we do research, but we also manage a few parks. And we also have an education program for kids on Curacao. Amazing. And um, we're... Here, here in the wet lab, what role, I mean, we talked about getting out on, and diving and finding out what's mm -hmm. on the reef, but, but why do you also have the reef inside? Yeah, so basically what we have here is a mini coral reef, if you want to uh, talk about it that way, and that is because, like, if you go diving, you only have a tank, there's only so much air that can go in it, so you cannot stay on the water forever. Um, if you want to work with corals or sponges or any other critter that lives on the reef, it's often that you need more time, and then because you need more time, Instead of going there, we bring the animals back to the lab here. We put them in a aquaria and keep them alive, and then we can sort of work on them here instead of on the reef if we need more time. Wow, that's amazing. Is it possible um, if you, Ellie's going to bring the camera around? We've ah. got a couple of tanks here. I mean, so this this is really sort of typical sort of science. Um, if you're if you're a coral reef researcher, what 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 can you explain to us sort of how and why the, these have been set up? Well, uh, they've set up for many reasons. There's a few researchers here at Kamabi. They all do different projects. Uh, so in each of these aquaria, a different story is going on. And then what you will actually see is that, like in many of these aquaria, there's actually not corals at all. Like in this one, you can see uh, corals, uh, but also a lot of sponges. But the funny thing is, is that like in a lot of um, aquaria, you don't see corals at all. And it is because like a coral reef, despite the fact that it's coral reef, there's actually a lot more living there than corals and a lot of people focus on corals uh, but right now we are actually focusing on a lot of other things like sponges that's these uh, pinky things uh, that live over here to sort of see what their role is on a coral reef like how they all work together if you will to sort of make a coral reef a coral reef amazing so i mean these are I, and i want to love to find out how you came to be on curacao and a little bit later in your career but for now, what were your things that you take for granted? I think our audiences around the world um, may, may, may not know that much about. Can, can we go sort of one by one to talk about what a sponge is, maybe with this one here, what a coral is? And is this a, an anemone or is it uh, yeah, behind? So, so what, what you have over here, that, that big hairy looking thing almost, is basically the building block of a coral. Okay. So each coral is a pull-up, it's an anemone, but then a small one. What you see here is an anemone that lives by itself, and it's a bigger one. 
they have these little uh, tentacles that they stick in the water and they use that to catch food. So you, you might see these little zebra stripes in them. Mm -hmm. And what those are are little stinging cells. Okay. And what they uh, use those stinging cells for is when plankton floats by little animals in the water, they sting them with those tentacles and then the tentacles pull in and then there's the pull-up the body of the anemone, if you will, that's down there. And then the tentacles pretty much stick the food in there and that's how it feeds in the water column. So if you would make that thing a lot smaller. Okay, so, so like sort of pinky fingernail size or even smaller than that? Even smaller than that. But like pinky size is a, is a good thing. So take that anemone, whoop, make it very small to something like your pinky size. Yeah. And that anemone, anemone is sort of living by itself like many anemones do. What corals do, they're like, mm, you know, let's go work together because, like, uh, together we're stronger, we can help each other, uh, they live together. Um, and what they do is that that pinky thing pretty much copies itself. So you get two polyps, two small polyps, and then it copies again, and you have four, eight, and it goes on and on and on. But at some point they run out of space. Like, there's a reef is just too busy, so what they have to do is like, hmm, if we cannot go to the side, it will be easier to go up. But how do we do that? Like, it would be nice if there was something to live on, and to live on something, a skeleton. Like, that's what we do as well. We have bones. Corals make skeletons as well. So these polyps together start making a skeleton. And that's sort of these so little... If you look at the maze ones, I think it's probably the, sort of, almost the, most, the, big, the biggest one in here. Yeah, so if you would zoom into that at night, because these uh, coral anemones... Like, so that, that's the, basically a carpet of copies of these little anemones. Mm -hmm. um, at night, they will come out. They're smaller, but they would look exactly like the anemone in the background. And then underneath them, and you cannot see it because the brown stuff that you see right now is basically the layer of polyps. But underneath it is the skeleton that they make, the skeleton okay. that they need to sort of live on. And that's something you can see actually here. Um, can, I, can I offer you maybe a... a, a, a yeah. So he, this is pretty much, if you would take off the layer of corals, yeah. All the polyps would come off. Then what you see is something like this, and that's the house that they built, the skeleton. Uh, it's hard as a rock, and then uh, basically in all these little valleys is where the little polyps live. And and this is a good example too because what you see here is another coral. And you see that it's brown now yep. because it has that layer of the coral polyp still on it. But if you would take that um, layer off, it would look like the one right next to it. Okay. And wow. then you can still see the little holes and these little holes, these little pits. That's the little holes, bits that the coral polyps live in. Wow. And then the cool thing is because like the same way a house is built of bricks, yep. like because corals build this and then after a while they die naturally, uh, other corals will start growing on this one and then it's brick on a brick and then it goes on and on and on. And then similar the way that people build houses. Basically these corals, by building these bricks, build a coral reef and then uh, they build a house, a house, a house, you get a city. And then in the city, like what people do is like it attracts other people, it attracts a lot of different people, and that happens on the same, uh, that happens the same on a coral reef. So if corals build the structure, the city on the water, if you will, out of these building blocks, like all the other organisms, like these sponges, for instance, that you saw, uh, will show up and start living in it. So, so just, I mean, it's amazing to think that this tiny anemone like uh, polyp smaller than my pinky fingernail is responsible for building some of the biggest structures yes. structures on the planet. And that is a cool thing because if you were an astronaut and you would go up in space, basically um, if you would look down on the on Earth from far away, you could see what we build as people. Uh, but the other thing you can see out of space are coral reefs and that's corals that um, build those. Wow. So people and coral reefs of corals have something in common is that people and corals build things that you can see that are so big that you can mm -hmm. see it from space. See from with the naked eye. Yeah. Wow. And then we're talking about um, this wider things. People, people think that, and I remember before I first went onto the reef, um, right. that I can put that back on the on the side. Right, yeah. Balance it. Can't hang, hang, hang out with his friends. Hang out with his friends. That the or, that you think that coral is very colourful. Mm -hmm. um, but when you come to the reef, often it's these sort of um, browny, greeny, yellowy yeah. mm -hmm. colours. Why, why, I mean, we, we, what, where does that colour come from? Well, the, the, like imagine if you would uh, walk through a forest, like yeah. there's a few trees that you can see around here, yeah. and what do you see? It's brown, it's green, and it's pretty much that same group of colours, and you can see it here with these col uh, corals that are in here, that you see on a coral reef. Yeah. And the reason why that is, um, is that corals live together 
with a tiny, tiny little algae that lives inside their tissue. And that algae uh, pretty much does what plants do. It takes sunlight, it uses it, and it makes sugar. And then um, corals use the sugar made by those algae to survive. So the coral provides a little algae with a house to live in. Okay. And then the algae pays the rent by providing sugar so they uh, can live. So in addition to catching stuff, corals can actually live off sunlight. And they do that with these little algae that are living inside their uh, tissue. But because of that, like, it's pretty much a plant. Wow. Uh, and that's a question that comes up a lot. Is a coral a stone because of the skeleton that you just yeah. saw? Is it an animal because it has tentacles and it can catch things like animals do? Or is it a plant because it lives from sunlight? The more light you find, the more corals you usually find. And the same thing as what you were saying. It's the same colors, if you will, as plants. And so that's why they're often very brown and green. And that's pretty much the same reason why plants, if you go to walk in a forest, there's different colors of brown, there's different colors of green. And that is because that's what plants look like. And they look that way because if sun, the sun comes in and it has all the different colors of light, all the yeah. different wavelengths in there, they pretty much use all of it except for green. So they use all the colors of the rainbow, but green comes back. Wow. And that's okay. why plants are green. Uh, and then with uh, corals, it's the same thing, but then it's a little browner. And then the reason why a lot of uh, coral reefs are very colorful, I mean, if you would look at the sponges, you can see so that that's where that's where the color is coming from. It's not necessarily the coral, yes. but it's the, the sponges. And then, so they're uh, still maybe a little dull, but they're at least not uh, brown or green. They're uh, pinkish. And then if you would go on the reef, you would find the yellows, the blues, all the colors of the rainbow. But even certain cor uh, corals, and especially if you would go to the Pacific, have lots of different colors. And uh, the reason why they have those is often because they use them, uh, they have certain pigments in them, and they use them as a sunscreen. Wow. So they uh, pretty much uh, take light. Uh, they don't want it because it's damaging. It's, there's too much of it. And then they have sunscreen that makes colors look different colors. But in the Caribbean, a lot of people are like, huh. I've been on vacation to the Pacific, it's all very colorful. Well, that's for two reasons. Because the corals over there have more sunscreens and therefore more different colors. Uh, there's more sponges and other things that give reef color too. So sponge, the, the type of thing that you use in the bath, uh, that, that's a plant? No, that's an animal too. It's an animal too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and so the, the sponge is pretty much the simplest version of an animal, the simplest version of us. So they cannot move, so that's something they have in uh, common with uh, corals. But pretty much a sponge is not much than a body, a sack, yeah. like we're a sack on legs pretty much, where things go in and we digest it and then it comes out again. And that's what a, uh, a sponge is as well, but a little simpler than that. So it, it, it filters through all the seawater, it takes out anything that yeah. you can get energy from and then the rest of this gets... Yeah, and then out. the cool thing about coral, uh, sorry, uh, sponges is that they can do something that we cannot. Okay. And that is, um, like, if you would go to the tropics, like the tropical oceans yeah. are pretty much like deserts. There's hardly any food. If you go to the middle of the ocean here, yeah. or even a few kilometers offshore, yeah. there's hardly living, something living in it because there's no food in the water. Okay. And that's something that uh, amazes people all the time. It's like, they imagine that you're in a sailing boat 400 yeah. years ago, and you're, you're crossing this ocean desert, and there's nothing in it. And then all at once you run into an island, and then, huh? There's all this life there. There's this coral reef, lots of fish, lots of corals, lots of other things that live in the city. Um, and then how can it be that you have so much life in a place where there's so little food? And the uh, sponges actually help with that because what they can do that we cannot yeah. is that they can basically drink the sugar from the water. A lot of organisms, corals and plants, uh, make sugars. They go in the water. You cannot see it. It's like having coffee with sugar in it. It's not that if we have a cup of coffee with sugar, that we can drink the sugar out of it. But yeah. sponges can. Okay. And then what they do is they make um, little cells. Uh, they use the sugar to grow. The new cells stay there. The old cells go out. They replace them. And the old cells are big enough for a lot of other coral reef organisms to see. And then they start eating those. So oh, therefore, wow. like the sponges pretty much take the sugar in your coffee, make it into sugar cubes so other animals can eat it. Amazing. Um, there's there's um, a whole load of questions for you uh -huh. from schools around the world, but, but before I before I get to these, I'd love to know how you ended up 
you know, on a tropical island, on the, doing, you know. sound, sounding like doing what you love. Uh, that's true. Um, it's actually very simple. Um, I always like to walk around in nature. It started actually by walking around in a forest. And then when you walk around, it's like a little puzzle that you see. You wonder why things there are not there. Why do these animals do this and uh, they don't do it over there? And then when you walk to a, um, a forest, I saw these like little stories in nature, as little puzzles that I wanted to solve. And then at some point, I started diving. And I'm like, well, not, forests are nice, but underwater is nicer. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, coral reefs are the nicest ones. And then uh, that's why I started coral, uh, studying coral reefs. It's just to try to solve the, the things that you see in nature, the little puzzles that are out there, and try to solve those. Wow, and that's just on and on and on. And then, well, well how did you get into diving? Was that just uh, you woke up one morning and said, I've, I've got to... I, see, um, see the I was actually the world. forced to go dive <laughs> with, uh, by my mother because my brother and I were uh, snorkeling in uh, France okay. and then we found a cave underwater and then we would go snorkeling all the time. And then my mother, who was on shore, uh, saw that happening. She's like, oh, I don't like this at all. Like, if you guys have to go underwater, don't snorkel into a cave. I'm gonna, when we return from vacation, you're going to go diving. And then so we were put on diving, me and my brother, and then that happened <laughs> <laughs> until this day. <laughs> What a what a lucky, yeah. lucky accident. Yeah, thanks, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got, I'm just going to read through some of the shout outs to some of the classes we've got uh -huh. joining us. We've got a year five class at Lansby Lawrence School in Tower Hamlets in London. Uh, hi. We have Anatolia College um, in Greece. Um, we've got uh, Mrs. Roop's fifth grade science class at Jonesville Middle School. And I think that's Virginia off the top of my head. Let me know if I'm wrong. And a shout out we've been sent in um, a couple more, which is um, eight Oak uh, Geography students in Collinson Grammar <coughs> School, Devon, um, the UK. And a big shout out to Primary Four Hill at Northlands Primary School in sunny Bermuda. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Um, great, we've just got to, so, um, wow, lots <laughs> of, um, so we, from Anatolia College in Greece, is it like, how did you become a, a coral reef ecologist? by being a naughty boy and that being curious is it from what I can and your mother saying go diving but the curiosity is, is the big thing it's it's puzzles it's 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 the same way that like uh, for instance if you uh, see a nice painting and then you want to know why people made it uh, a, a yeah. painting that way but then yeah it's because normally there's a, maybe a crazy person painting yeah uh, like with nature stories with nature's puzzles it's a little more interesting I find because the the rules to the game are less crazy and sort of finding out the rules for the for the game like the, the the rules that result in what we see out there finding those because there's a lot we don't know like i yeah. said like especially on the water because we only can die for six years there's a lot of these puzzles still to be done on the water amazing um and what has been the most fascinating experience you've had um during your research um, that probably was, because the nice thing is, like, uh, being on Curacao is one thing, but working on coral reefs takes you to uh, coral reefs uh, all around the world. And then, uh, as people know, a lot of coral reefs are not doing too well. Um, but, but still, there's islands uh, that nobody goes to, and those are in the middle of the Pacific, and because they're really far, you have to sit in a boat for four or five days to get there. Um, it's pretty much what the past looked like. Like if wow. you imagine, like if I could jump in the water 200 years ago, what would it look like? And it's on those islands where it still is like that. The water is clear, corals are everywhere, there are sharks everywhere swimming around. And then you have an idea, a sort of view back in time of what wow. coral reefs once looked like. And that, the, the first time that that happens, and you jump in and you're like, whoa, this is insane. Wow, and I mean, can I just ask you, because we're talking about sort of today about all the animals that, that rely on the reef, what is it about sort of corals and sponges that sort of help to support, you talked about it a little bit, but we, I mean, coral reefs support 25% of all marine species. Yeah. How, 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 how is that happening and how, does, and how, how else can, can they start to... And to well, that is in large part because... Um, I mean, if you think about it like a forest again, it's, it's like if you would have a field with only grass, there's not many animals in there. But if you have a lot of trees on that same area, like if the trees are there, the uh, birds start showing up, there's the insects that show up, attracted by the uh, flowers uh, of the trees. And something like that is actually ha happening on coral reefs as well. So if it's just to uh, a flat surface somewhere, nothing happens. But if corals start building yeah. these um, 
these cities on the water, the, the other organisms, fish, crustaceans, little crabs, octopuses, all start show up to start living in that city, it's similar to you have more uh, animals in your yard when there's yeah. trees around. Yeah. And, and you talk about sharks, how, how do sharks, because sharks obviously aren't eating coral, they probably don't live in the sort of small nooks and crannies. Uh, no. H how, how, how come there are so many sharks connected to the reef? How, how does that work? Um, <coughs> like probably from some old pri primary age. Yeah, the, and, and, and sharks are always cool to talk about. Um, like imagine again that ocean desert, there's no food there, there's maybe a, a few schools of tuna swimming around, they're sort of roving this desert looking for food, but overall there's not a whole lot. So here you are a shark looking for fish to eat. So where do you go? Like you go to these places where you have this uh, oasis, if you will, on the water, the oasis in the ocean desert, which are these coral reefs. And because there's so much food, in large part, thanks to these uh, sponges, sort yeah. of taking that sugar and making it available to other organisms on a reef, um, like coral reefs is just where the food is. And that's the same way as like, hey, where do all kids go on a uh, schoolyard? It's where you put the cake because that's where the food is, that's yeah. where the good stuff is. And then uh, with coral reefs, it's pretty much the same. Like where the food is, the fish, the fish that live in that city, like sharks will show up and hang out and to eat them. I mean, and just leading on from that, this is a question from Lansby Lawrence in London. Um, is why, why, are these, why, are the, why is that important for the sort of ocean health to have these cakes? Uh-huh. And, and, and this might be a, a little weird analogy, but that, that's pretty much because sharks are almost like uh, why you have a fridge in your kitchen. Imagine this, like you're in the tropic, it's yeah. warm, you're on the water. Uh, if you would take a piece of meat and put it down on the floor, what would happen with it? It would rot away right away. So basically what you want to have, and that's why you have a fridge, is you want to have uh, the things that can rot, so biomass, if you will, yeah. uh, the, 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 all the little food, you want to have it somewhere where it doesn't go bad. And that go, uh, we have fridges for that, but if sharks eat it, yeah. Uh, it's in a shark, and then the shark swims around with it. It's, it's packaged uh, the same way uh, it's packaged in the fridge. And then it doesn't rot away. And because it doesn't rot away, there's no rotting on the water. And therefore, we scan sort of, and all the other animals that live there uh, are not in this sort of water with rotting things that will kill them as well. And that's why sharks are important, is that they hold on to um, uh, yeah, the, the food on a reef. So bacteria don't get it so things don't run away and that's why they're important and, and, and then when they do die th that that's easy for the other species to yeah get hold and of. then of course like uh, like on land the bacteria would eat them but then uh, the bacteria are eaten by these sponges again it becomes sugar cubes again other things start eating but then it's, it's maintained it's recycled it sounds like the coral reef is is uh, an amazing example of recycling very tight recycling yeah and that, that's the only reason why it's possible. And that's, for instance, also if you would jump in the water, uh, what you would see, because again, it's an ocean desert, there's nothing there. So to make it work in such a harsh environment where there's so uh, little food is to work together. And the example that we talked about, the b yeah. best example is those corals living together with those algae. Corals providing algae with a house, algae providing corals with sugar. And only because they work together, they can actually make it in such a, a nutrient poor environment. Amazing. A um, question from, from Anatolia um, College in Greece. Um, we've talked a little bit about you know, your research and, and seeing it. If you could just describe you know, what, what it was like the first time you, you dived on a reef, what is that sensation of, of being in, in the underwater world? And, and were you afraid? The, 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 the first time was on Bonaire uh, 25 years ago, and I remember running out of air. Uh, because you're diving and that was the first time I saw a coral reef and you're like, wow, 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 you're not paying attention to diving anymore. And at some point the, uh, the tank was empty and uh, it had to go up. But that's sort of what it does to you. It, it is something that when you see it for the first time, even reefs that are not that healthy, like are all over the planet right now, it, it is just the prettiest, most elegant thing you've ever seen. Wow. Um, we've, we've got a lot of questions. Um about about harm to reef, which I want to sort of maybe leave 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 to the end because mm -hmm. there's lots of very concerned um, students. So we'll, we'll come to that um, at the end, and some great questions there. But I'm just going to sk skip through these and ask questions sort of more related to uh, um, maybe sort of like your your job and your role. 
And um, this is from um, students at Collington Grammar School in Devon in the UK. Sophie and Nicholas would like to know what is the best part of your job? That, that is the diving. Uh, even uh, yesterday, like we were diving here in Curaçao and that was to go find out um, how certain coral species that we don't even know when they release their babies, yeah. um, trying to find out when they do. Because right now it's a time that a, coral, uh, a lot of corals release their babies. They only do that once a year. So on these few nights a year, uh, it's time to jump in the water and go see, like, hey, coral species, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know when you uh, release your babies. How do you do it? And go find those. So it's things like that to jump in the water and go find these things that nobody knows that I think is interesting. Amazing. Um, we're now going to go to students um, in Bermuda, where we were for, for Coral Live um, last year. Uh -huh. Um, they're, they're wondering what types of coral do we have here in Curaçao? They may be a bit different from... Uh, it's, it's largely similar. Okay. Like uh, if you go across the Caribbean and Bermuda is a little bit out there, but, but, but uh, pretty much everything that's in Bermuda is here as well. Okay. And we have uh, more or certain species. Bermuda has uh, more of others, but like the uh, coral species, yeah. uh, there's around 100. Uh, on a Caribbean reefs, pretty much if you would go look very well, you can find them all here. And if you go look very well in Bermuda, you would find them all there. So and it's the same. So we've got things like for for, for those um, students watching who aren't familiar, there's brain corals, there's branching corals, there's these different types that you might see, the elkhorn. Yeah, and 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 so that that that's the way that people look at uh, corals because what they pretty much would do. Is, is, is sort of classify, and this is because people could not dive. So what, if you cannot dive back in the day, people did know there were corals and they wanted to classify them. So okay. they, what would they do? It's like, well, this one is round, this one is branching, so they're different. This one has these little holes, little coral lights that yeah. the polyps live in. They look like this and another coral looks different, so that's different species. Um, so all these 100 species have been classified based on what they look, but what we find right now is that things can look, corals can actually do way more than we think is that uh, if I had two of these and they would look exactly the same, yeah. this is a completely different species than the one that looks the same. They have different behavior, they reproduce differently. So there's actually probably way more coral species than we think. And just because we as people uh, have to classify based on what they look like, we cannot see it because they all look the same to us, but they're for sure different. Wow. Um, a little bit about now about, about your, the, your, your job here. Uh -huh. uh, um, one question from... Um, from Edinburgh, Laura in Edinburgh would like to know what skills do you need um, to be good at your job? I, I, to be honest, and what I've seen here too, because every year we get two, three hundred students sort of come through, so it's nice because then you can see them come in and then a few later you know uh, what, what sort of happened to them and whether they actually got the job they wanted, the job yeah. working on Corby's. And it is, I think, curiosity is to be out there and sort of question a little bit what everybody thinks like well okay if we know it all then we don't have to go in the water because we know it all but then if you go dive in the water you're like eh, all these stories that people say it's sort of true but there's more to it and then you start looking and then everything else yeah. you can sort of learn you can learn how to write scientific papers you can learn statistics you can learn how to dive uh, but, but the sort of like huh the little voice in the head that says like something is weird going on that I think is what you need. So it's almost a science instinct, and, and yeah, a naturalist instinct. That's that's actually why often, like if you go to uh, a coral reef, uh, the people that know most about it are people, the naturalist people. They're not even scientists. They just like to look at things and they study things very meticulously. And then they're able to tell all these stories that, like researchers that come through, are like, "Ooh, I didn't know that." And um, yeah, looking for those stories is what and I think so is cool. Observing well seems to be almost a yeah. I would say so, and, and, and th 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 that is again, like try to see what nobody's ever seen before because these things are out there. Amazing, and, and just a little bit about um, sort of, yes, <laughs> put calls down Back again. Back to their home. <laughs> um, is uh, how does technology help? I mean, you talked a little bit about scuba. Whew. But that, yeah, that, that is a big thing. For instance, uh, and it happens in multiple areas because uh, like what, what I was just saying, things look the same. Uh, but they're different. How do we know that? It's because of uh, DNA and genetics. And that was impossible 20 years ago. And it's the technological uh, advances in that part that actually help us see that now. Uh, so that's one thing. That's more technology for the lab. 
Uh, but then there's also the technology to work on the water. Yeah. And then what do we see? It's like diving equipment got better so we can go further, we go deeper. There's a submersible that we have right now so we can oh, wow. go even deeper that you can even dive to. Uh, but it's also if you want to take, uh, for instance, pictures, you want to see, hey, I have a coral reef. Uh, how's it going to uh, look like a year from now? Well, right now you have to sort of go with a camera and count stuff with measurement tapes. It's very labor intensive. What we s start seeing right now is that you pretty much get drones on the water that sort of go fly around like blip, up, 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 and they wow. take this like pictures and then you can sit on the shore, wait for it to be done. And then the drone will actually do a way better job than we can. Amazing. So that, that, yeah, that is for sure happening. So a, a few questions are coming up about harming corals. Mm -hmm. We've seen the corals that you've got in here. Students in Bermuda and, and elsewhere have said that you know they've read that you shouldn't touch corals. Yeah. How because well, it harms them, it's not good for them. How how do you go about collecting samples and specimens without doing too much harm? Well, to what, the reef? what we usually do, and um, that that is. I guess best example by by this one. Like so, if you have this coral, yeah, like the living beast. Uh, the little carpet of anemones, if you will, would sort of go around, but it would go to here. Okay. So what we do, and, and each coral sort of has a version of that, but, but the tissue, the living animal, yeah. doesn't go all the way. So then what you do is you, you chop it off underneath the tissue. You just break okay. the skeleton so the a animal that's on here is not damaged. Brilliant. And then you take this to the lab, put it in, and then uh, you use it for a while. And then when you're done with it, there's like special on the water glue that we have. You go back to where you got this from, and then you're like, oh, you're, you you're, you're glued you glue back and on. The, and the survivability is high. High. Yeah. And you can actually put them at better places most of the time. So they're like, well, thanks for moving me. <laughs> like life just got better. And um, and what is it that if you touch the corals, how does that harm them? Is, is it so people think about the oils in your skin, or is physical harm, or well, what's going and, on there? And, and so this one is pretty much a good example. So here's that skeleton. And yeah. here, I just did this, yeah. and then a hopper can have a hole in my hand. Yeah. Like, uh, and that is because th this is rock hard, and you can and see these little blades everywhere. Yeah. And it's, yeah, sharp. So imagine uh, if you would, uh, because corals don't have a bone themselves, it's just like a sack full of water. Okay. So imagine if you would have a sack full of water, like a balloon or something with water in it, and you, you go, smush, boom, yeah. it explodes. And then that's the same thing that happens with corals. It's like because they're on there like little water balloons almost. If you push on them, they're like uh, okay. on, the, on these sharp things and then they break apart. Amazing. Um, so just, we're just going to go back. These are, these are students um, interested in, in, in sort of career type, type, type things. Uh -huh. um, this is sort of Arthur um, in London and Daniel also in the UK. Um, what did you want to be when you were at school? Because I think they're obviously thinking about careers and did you always want to be a, a scientist? Well, actually, uh, I, uh, in the beginning, I wanted to be an astronomer. And uh, I was looking at stars, making telescopes, our little toilet rolls to uh, uh, look at the sky. But then when the diving happened, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, it would be nice to go in a spaceship and um, uh, fly around to see what's out there. But that's pretty much what underwater is too. I mean, because you're diving, you're almost like a plane flying around underwater. And then there's all these stories, and there's way more, I think, than there are in space. So when that happened, I was like, okay, no more stars and planets uh, on the water. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you couldn't be a coral scientist, you'd be an astronomer? R yeah. Well, I don't even think about that question anymore. <laughs> it, like, this is, this is it, and that's what it always be. That was all. Um, and and this, what, what is, we, you've talked about the joys of uh, working on the reef and, and satisfying your curiosity and passion about the natural world. What is the hardest thing about your job? Uh, ooh. It's actually not that bad, I would say. Uh, <laughs> the hardest might, might actually be the... Uh, so when you're in coral research, you have to write papers and work together with uh, colleagues to sort of advance together the fuel yeah. of coral reefs. Uh, to make sure that like all these stories that are out there are discovered fast enough so we can use them to make uh, good decisions about management and stuff. And what I sometimes find hard is that people are unwilling to see the stories, is that there is a um, tendency like, well, here's how I think the world works and it will always be like that. And if you then you say like, hey, but look at this, like everybody would see that your story is largely true and true maybe other places. 
but not here. So there's something going on, something that we don't, didn't know yet. And I know that cannot be true. And when those things happen, I sometimes think like, oh, I wish that <laughs> that wasn't happen as often as it does, actually. So, so uh, disagreements and, and stubbornness within some... Yeah, stubbornness. Like, uh, uh, in, in a way, why do people care, right? Like, isn't the goal all to sort of figure out these stories sooner than later? And then, yeah, there's a lot of people that are like, well, here, I studied something for five years, and then for the next ten years, I'm going to um, uh, say that that is how the world works. And that, so that's almost like a, a good thing to think about. It's like, well, if, if you ever get in a position like this or study, we know that these stories, will all, there will always be new ones and, and never get stuck in, like, now we're done. Because you see that a lot, that people in Let's sort of it. investigate, and then, yeah, or they think it's, it, it's done. Like, we know it all. No. Yeah. These stories, we'll, we'll be wrong about what we say right now, 50 years from now. But just keep going and sort of find out how it works, because that never ends. So science is a, is a process rather than a, a final destination. Oh, for sure, for sure. But then you sort of run into what you're saying. There's people that, yeah, like we do something, and then we're done. And then we're going to sit behind the desk and then yell at everybody, like, I'm right, you guys are wrong, and that, that's it. Like, that, there could be less of that. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I'm going to... Two things I'd love to do, and uh, um, we've only got sort of nine more minutes. Mm -hmm. um, one of which is before, I want to really talk about the concerns that young people have about the harm that's being caused to the, to the reefs around the world, and also sort of what these concerned students can do in their everyday lives. Uh -huh. But before that, I'd love to, if we could just have a little tour, because what I'd love is for some of the students watching to just get a sense of what a sort of what's, daily what's life in here? Of, 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 you know, being a research scientist might involve. Um, so, Ellie, if you, if you focus on, on Mark and then um, he'll tell you sort of all, all, all the different things, I'll make sure that any leads don't get too tangled. So here, l l let's just walk through the stories that are in these uh, things. Like, again, like you see a, um, an aquarium with nothing in it. There's a little leaf floating around, but that should be there. But what you see here are these little um, uh, pinky things and these are surprisingly enough algae as well like they uh, just like corals make skeleton and they're pink uh, they're called crustose algae and these things are important because like crustose algae are actually the traffic control for baby corals like baby corals when corals are born they're little larvae they swim around and they swim around the big ocean and then they don't necessarily they don't know where to go to so these algae make um, certain substances that they throw in the water that tell baby corals the little larvae that are, that are swimming around like hey here's the reef and settle on me because there's no gnarly sponges or gnarly algae around because i'm there and then little larvae will come down and then settle on these uh, little things and then this takes that a little further because like little corals also need a little house because like if you would be a coral and you would sort of sit somewhere on top of a flat surface and there's a crap or something coming by it's going to step on you and you're flat so corals, um, for instance, baby corals like these little houses. So we build them little apartments. And then you see that that pink algae is growing on this as well. And what we're trying to find out right now is like, hey, do they like small houses, big houses? But where do they like to go? Where do they like to attach to the uh, reef? Because like when coral larvae attach, corals can get hundreds of years old. So they better decide well, because they're going to be there for a while. So all these little tiles that you see here are all these little experiments like, do they like this, do they like this? And then when they settle, for instance, on something like this, so you get a little larvae stuck, it turns into a pollock, it starts building a skeleton, grow, 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 becomes a, a coral colony. We put it back on the reef and then sort of can help nature by, by providing more baby uh, corals. <clears throat> and that's why, for instance, these things, like slugs, everybody thinks that those are disgusting it's like basically a tongue in a house and it's like blah, 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 going around all day long you can sort of see the little beak snoozle uh, around and what, what they do is like you can sort of see that there's no algae in here and it's because these uh, little slugs like also for instance parrotfish what they do is they take algae off the reef and because they do uh, corals and algae never run into each other because algae can overgrow corals and kill them in various ways but because of these herbivores, the herb eaters, the animals that eat plants, like parrotfish as well, like pretty much all the bad guys, all the bad algae are gone, so corals have space to grow. Um, what you see here is another one of the uh, 
experiments, like these actually do have baby corals on them. The baby corals were born uh, last month, and they're, not, they're so small, they're the size of a sesame seed, so you cannot see them sit on these uh, little tiles. Uh, but they're on there, and then uh, we try to see how they do, and how fast they grow. Uh, in these experiments, what you see here, it's pretty much like, okay, well, if coral babies settle and then they're sort of stuck to the bottom, uh, we want to know what do they like. And this experiment, and again, because they're baby corals, you don't really see them, is that there is uh, water going through all these bins at different speed. And there's little plankton uh, beasts, little copepods are in here. And then on these little plates that you see in there, uh, that's where the baby corals are. And then what we try to find out is like, what is the water speed? So what should the environment look like? Um, that allows these baby corals to feed the most. Because like people, like if uh, you eat more, you're healthier. And the idea with this is, it's like, hey, they settle, they're stuck to the bottom, but if we can sort of find out where they do best, where they can eat the most, they can grow even further. Um, <clears throat> what you then see here is uh, sponges. I guess they look like little turds actually, but they, they're, they are sponges, so there's two different species in here. It's sort of yeah, turd looking thing, I guess, and uh, this pink one. So you can sort of see here as well, uh, this sponge, like it sucks in water through the side, two tiny holes that you cannot see, and then that big hole on top, that's where the water comes out. And then as the water goes through, the sugar, the dissolved sugar is being taken up. And then uh, it sort of spits out all these little sugar cubes again. It's all tissue that like other things can uh, live from. But this is to sort of study that process. This is an experiment that's being used to see which sponges do eat the sugar from the coffee, if you will, uh, and are therefore important to um, uh, sort of provide the rest of the reef with uh, food. And then the last thing that we have is uh, here. So what you see in these uh, cones, this is again from um, uh, last month, is that uh, we caught a lot of eggs and a lot of sperms from uh, corals. You put them together, you get a little coral baby. Uh, these larvae, the size of sesame seeds, swim around, and then they settle. So here we gave them a little, these mushroom looking things, our little substrates that they settled on. And now we're trying to uh, raise them in a very clean environment. That's actually what those things are, the little filters on top. Because there are uh, a lot of microbes in the water nowadays that are not good for corals. That's why they get sick, but that's also why the little babies die. And what this does, like these white, uh, 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 these white things, um, are actually taking out the microbes. So the big chunks, this water is coming from the ocean. The big chunks are taken out here, smaller chunks, smaller chunks, and then the microbes are taken out uh, over here. So the water that then comes out is actually almost sterile. And then because it's sterile, there's no bad microbes in there. So the water then goes into these cones with the baby corals so they can actually live. It's almost like a box that babies are grown in, like when they're born and they have little problems right after they're born. They put them in a glass box to ta ex take extra care of them. And this is sort of exactly what that is for them for, uh, for baby corals. And then we let them grow. We find out how, um, what and how fast they feed. And then when they grew a little bit, so the polyp divided in two, four, and it's uh, a little bigger. Uh, these little mushrooms can be used to point, point, stick them back on the reef, and then uh, so we can help Mother Nature by uh, providing more baby corals that will replace these corals that die for natural reasons or because people are, are stupid, pretty much. And then in these boxes here, it's like, it's always a little bit of handicraft. That's actually a fun part about uh, coral reef ecology, too. Like you're always in a, in a field and you have to work with what you have. Um, so we built this um, aquarium out of office materials, but it works. Uh, and then what you see in here, it's probably bubbling really fast, is also these uh, sponges, tiny guy down there, this is an orange one. And that's again to sort of see uh, how much sugar they can eat and how many sugar cubes they produce. It looks fancy almost, like when you do it that way. Thank you so much for, I think, well, let's come to the other side of this um, pipe. So like, yeah, this this, this is the, the water going in. <laughs> water going in. Um, amazing to see sort of science, science in action. I, I think really, really important uh, for students because a lot of the time at school you sort of learn what, you know, 
dead white guys found out sort of, uh -huh. you know 100 years ago and it's, it's it's always sort of interesting to sort of see what practicing science looks well like. and and that's the nice thing especially for those living on islands like you're in a place where you can jump in the water pretty much every day and go see these stories and that gives you an amazing head start over for instance the people from the universities that come over for two weeks a year uh, don't have the time to look into things well it's the nicest thing to do actually so for those that have the possibility but this is true for forest as well um, to sort of go to a place and go o go there over and over and over again because then you see things change and that's where it gets interesting because you can go out and see like well look here's corals or here's trees but when you start seeing change you see them doing things almost and that's where the stories come from and if you're in the uh, uh, luxury position that you're living on a, a tropical island somewhere uh, starting by by looking at these stories jumping in the water and just go look is a, is a good start amazing uh, so just to end I mean we're pretty well out of time but um, can you share with our audiences um, uh, you know around the world you know, there are problems with the coral reef. We're going to talk more about that with Rene on, on Friday, mm -hmm. about you know, some of the, the, the bigger issues with, with, with warming and, and acidification and maybe some of the local issues as well. But what, what can people do um, if they feel that they want to support? Because, I mean, first of all, are coral reefs in trouble? And well, then what all, can we do? All, not all. Not all. I mean, the, the story about coral reefs is often painted a little too harsh. Uh, there's still corries that uh, there's corals that grow still, yeah. uh, not necessarily corries. So there's species that can still grow even today. Does that look, mean that like reefs will look different uh, 50 years from now? Maybe, but it's not that all corals die like some people seem to think. But um, what can you do? I think one of the most important things to realize is that like if you um, want to go protect reefs, don't go write the story that protection is needed. Because there's a lot of people here as well, they go count corals, they say there's less now than there was in the past, and therefore coral reefs need to be protected. Well, we know that already. So it really sort of comes down to not the message, but to actually doing it. Yeah. And, and, and what that means is, is that like not only, uh, like the people that measure stuff on the water to make the case, that's done. Like if you don't know by now that coral reefs are in trouble, uh, then go do it. But then uh, if you want to help coral reefs, yeah, we should all fly less and b b uh, drive cars less. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, what you need is the technology. So you can actually drive easy in an electrical car uh, to make planes uh, work better. But also, like there's a lot of bad people around. Uh, there's a lot of uh, governments that actually want to do the right thing because a lot of the problems actually that coral reefs are facing are not in the water, they're actually on land. It's what we do on land that sort of determines what coral reefs look like. People need help with that, like let's start making better plants so that if what happens on land is done in such a way that it no longer so affects factories. And factories, how to build hotels, what to do with wastewater systems. Like, if you want to help coral reefs, go think of the next best wastewater system that is affordable for tropical islands, so all the sewage water doesn't end up in the ocean uh, anymore. So what I'm trying to say is that, like, we don't need people saying that sewage water is entering the ocean and killing coral reefs. We know that already. We need people now that are going to build the water treatment facilities so that doesn't happen anymore. And that might in involve a uh, super sponge. That, and, and that's true, because uh, uh, that happens a lot. Like, we've actually uh, experimented with, and this is where nature is almost more amazing than you think. There was a place where there is really, really gnarly microbes coming out of a sewage system. If you would drink the water, you would get sick beyond belief. But then if you put these sponges uh, in there, like, because they can take stuff out of the water, they can actually clean the water. So why build a um, water treatment facility if you can let sponges do the work for you? Mangroves do the same thing. Uh, and and that, that, that is a thing. So building with nature is what they call it because it's often cheap. You don't have to build anything yourself because nature already does it. Like how does that work? Again, that's a lot of stories that we don't know yet. But stories that are directly beneficial to us because why wouldn't you want a sponge filter out the stuff in the water that will make us sick if we jump in it? So it sounds like the big message here and um, the takeaway from our whole conversation really is that you maybe feel that we've ignored nature for too long. If we observe, if we listen, if we and, and look at that how it can help us. That is if you want to do, the, the stories are important if you want to, uh, if you just want to tell nature stories. Yes. 
B but don't go tell nature stories to make the case for nature needs to be protected because those stories are already out there. It's just work for nothing. Uh, but it should be fine to just to be a scientist, talk about what nature is and not worry about the implications or yeah. the management implications because that's for other people to worry about. And they should do it. But then that group of people is actually smaller than you might think. So who are the people that can sort of use the information from science to effectively uh, uh, protect weeds? There's not that many. There's a lot of help needed in that area. So what you have to think about then, policy makers, lawyers, it's people more like that. It's saving weeds, but not by putting on a wetsuit. It's by putting on a tie. And, 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 and that's where it all happens. There's a few people that are doing it, but they for sure can need uh, uh, a lot more. And then there's the technological aspect of it. Like, go build the water treatment facility. Go think about how to build the hotels. So all that stuff that goes in the water right now can actually... But we're, we're, we're picking up with a mind to the science, knowing how what you're doing works within the natural... Yeah, system. it's like you have to do this as a group. That's why I was yeah. also saying that why it's so annoying that some people are so inflexible and don't want to sort of work as a group. Because, like, in order to... Corvies are everywhere. They're in big problems in, in a lot of places. If you don't work together with the policy people, the scientists, the people that know stories, the people that have seen the old fishermen, it's not, the technology people, it's not going to happen. So to build this group, fill in all these positions that are um, uh, men, not, not sufficiently, is what eventually I think will... It's not going to save all reefs, but it will uh, probably save more than we think. Okay, so there we have it. Um, we know what the problems are. But by getting groups of scientists, designers, policy makers, yeah. lawyers, talking about the problem is not going to solve it. Solution-focused groups and teamwork might just get the, the, the natural world a little bit more stable. We, we can s send stuff to space. I don't see why we cannot do something similar on, on Earth. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You're it's welcome. been a pleasure talking to you. Um, and uh, thank you so much to all the schools who've been watching.